Welcome to our session on the Ouroboros Protocol. I'm your host, Miriam Wester, and I'm joined today by five of the principal architects of the system to discuss the current state of the art and the active research efforts that will support the protocol's next incarnation, Ouroboros Omega. I'll let my colleagues briefly introduce themselves before we begin the discussion in earnest. Hello, everyone. I'm Magyalus Kajas. I'm the chief scientist at Input Output, and I'm a professor at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, UK. Hi, everyone. My name is Christian Badercher, and I'm a research fellow uh, in cryptography at Input Output. Hello, my name is uh, Sandro Corredi Drayton, um, also a research fellow at uh, Input Output. Hi everyone, my name is Peter Gaji and I'm also a research fellow at, uh, at Input Output and I've been uh, working on, uh, among other things, on this Ouroboros family of protocols that we will discuss today. Oh, hey everyone, I'm Alex Russell. I'm a senior research fellow at IOHK and a professor of computer science at the University of Connecticut. With the introductions behind us, Agalos will begin with an overview of the Ouroboros protocol to set the stage for a survey of current research efforts. Agalos, please go ahead. Thank you, Miriam. So the Ouroboros design began almost seven years ago. The original primary aim was to answer the question whether there exists a protocol with similar decentralization profile as that of Bitcoin, but without the energy expenditure. Our other aims included incentives alignment and scalability. Before discussing the protocol itself, it is worth saying a few words about the design philosophy behind the protocol design. In contrast to other development efforts at the time, the focus from day one was on rigorous proofs of security, correctness, scalability and performance. We do not view this as a choice, but as a necessity. Computer security, contrary to, let's say, high performance as a property is an elusive concept and that is impossible to design for without a sound theoretical understanding of what it means. This is where mathematical rigor comes into play. The core consensus protocol of Roboros was developed over a sequence of three peer-reviewed articles that were recognized as important scientific advances in the area of cryptography and security. Ouroboros was the first probably secure proof-of-stake blockchain protocol, the first to be accompanied by game theoretic analysis and also the first to address the challenge of delivering a truly decentralized protocol that permits new participants to safely join the protocol without relying on external checkpoints or other centralized crutches. This version of the protocol has come to be known as Ouroboros Genesis, to emphasize that full security arises from a single common object, the Genesis block. Ouroboros implemented in stages and been successfully serving the Cardano blockchain since 2017. With the arrival of smart contracts on its main chain, the protocol will be able to accommodate its evolution into Ouroboros Hydra, which is a suite of layer two sub protocols that enable users to scale its operation to the limits of the internet. While Ouroboros as it is now provides a scalable, secure and energy efficient decentralized foundation for Cardano, there is a wide array of protocol improvements that are possible, particularly on maintain consensus. These provide even stronger scalability, security and performance. Collectively, we refer to these novel design elements as Ouroboros Omega, the ultimate addition to the Ouroboros family. In this panel, I'm joined by my colleagues Alex, Christian, and Peter, and Sandro, and we're going to do a deep dive into them. Thank you, Agalos. The first steps on the way from Genesis to Omega focus on resilience, and our first order of business was to understand the exact security guarantees provided by Genesis and related protocols. Peter, can you maybe explain our findings here? Uh, sure. Thank you, Miriam. Um... Uh, so, as we all know, the Ouroboros protocol is a longest general style protocol and is in this particular aspect uh, similar to Bitcoin. Uh, there has been a long line of uh, research work I mean, aiming at understanding the security of uh, the longest general paradigm that was primarily motivated by Bitcoin itself. Uh, people first considered specific attacks. Uh, in fact, the Nakamoto's white, white paper itself contains an analysis 
of the so-called private mining attack, concluding that honest majority is needed to prevent it. Uh, and only later, the academic community aimed at the gold standard of uh, proving security against all possible attacks uh, within a well-established model. And this model uh, initially contained some idealizations, such as uh, full synchronicity, where messages were delivered immediately uh, from one party to, uh, to another, uh, and only later uh, uh, accounted for, uh, for message delays. And the reason I'm mentioning this is that message delays, in fact, turn out to be the key complication in analyzing, uh, analyzing the longest chain of style protocol. So if you, if you take the extreme example and consider Bitcoin uh, running on a network with, say, one hour delivery delays, for, so delay for delivering a message between two parties, then even with honest majority, uh, the consensus would be difficult to achieve as honest block creators uh, would not know about other blocks created by their fellow miners and a relatively weak adversary with better network connectivity could create a dominating chain. Of course, uh, this situation is very unlikely with the conservative parametrization of Bitcoin, but it uh, can become an issue for more aggressively parametrized blockchains, and it is, an import it is important to understand where the tipping point is. So uh, we, uh, we decided to, to understand exactly this relationship with respect to the two key parameters, the share of the total power controlled by the adversary, and how the network induced message delays, the, 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 mess, uh, the delays induced by the network, compared to the block creation time, which is a parameter of the protocol. And the, uh, as you can see uh, in the slide, uh, we gave a full answer to this question uh, in a recent work where we closed the previously existing gap and gave a tight characterization of what adversarial power can be tolerated, assuming some honest power and some bound on uh, network delays. Uh, note that uh, just looking at the graph, as we move uh, right on the x-axis on the display plot, the, uh, the network delays are growing uh, compared to the block creation time, and hence only progressively weaker adversaries can be tolerated. And by the way, note that this applies to both proof of work and proof of stake, uh, where by adversarial power we mean either the proportion of hashing power or the stake at the disposal of the adversary, respectively. So. Uh, this is an important starting point for parameterizing any longest chain rule style protocol as it tells us how to choose the block creation interval and how this choice affects the ratio of adversarial stake that can be tolerated. Right, great. Peter, um, perhaps I can pick up here and discuss a continuing line of research. That's the effort to apply these techniques to establish concrete guarantees on transaction settlement. So the reason this is a challenge is that the formal security regime that Peter just discussed is defined in an asymptotic sense. So specifically, those results describe exactly which combinations of networking delays, honest resources, and adversarial resources will result in eventual consistency on the longest chain. However, they don't answer the concrete question of how quickly the chain actually stabilizes. And obviously, this is a matter of primary importance when it comes to understanding transaction settlement on deployed blockchains. So our current work aims to resolve this, this higher resolution question. So while it involves new probabilistic modeling and analysis, the goal is a family of efficient algorithms to compute explicit final settlement guarantees in both the proof of work and the proof of stake setting. So for example, the graphs shown in this slide are taken from a recent research article that establishes explicit bounds in the proof of work case. And the particular range of parameters you see here actually zero in on the guarantees offered by the, the Bitcoin rule of thumb that declares a transaction to be effectively settled once it has been buried by six following blocks. So to give a sense for uh, what the theory can do, it turns out that there's no more than a 0.17 chance of a six block reversion with the 10% Bitcoin adversary. Thanks, Alex. Um, given the analysis you both mentioned, it still remains to understand how the protocol behaves if the honest majority assumption is temporarily violated and whether the, it provides some self-healing. So Christian, what's the relevance of this security property and what guarantees do protocols like Ouroboros or Bitcoin have? Thanks, Miriam. Yes, so the self-healing property is indeed an important dimension if you look at the resilience of uh, blockchains. So in a, in a recent project, we actually explored the ability of uh, longest chain Nakamoto style protocols, as you said, or Ouroboros or Bitcoin to recover from what we call adversarial spikes, um, which are exactly, you know, the, the spikes 
that we so the spikes we refer to are the uh, kind of are the, the fact that the, the adversary has a majority of computing power in the proof of work case or a majority of active participating stake uh, over a certain period of time. So, and, and what we know from uh, the research uh, in general, from the consensus literature, is that consensus is impossible if we face uh, a majority of adversarial parties. But what the longest chain rule and like this Nakamoto style blockchains have is the ability to recover from temporary periods of adversarial majority. And I would like to point out that this is not just uh, of theoretical interest. So such a situation could essentially occur if, if for example, a, no, a lot of honest nodes uh, drop uh, or go offline. Uh, so it's, it's also a concern that you have to understand. And as I said before, we find that the system can recover and more importantly, uh, we quantify the impact of such a spike on the state of the blockchain, for example, prior to the attack. So what we, so if you look at the slide and, and to be a bit more concrete, we actually answer the question, how, how much of an existing blockchain can be eroded by say a one hour long uh, spike? So, and moreover, how long does it take to, so for the blockchain to recover again and recover in the sense that it provides after this re healing period, the same strong consistency and liveness guarantees as uh, as before such an attack. As you would expect, this uh, you know there, there is a trade-off that depends on the strength and the length of a, of a spike, and determining this trade-off is precisely a kind of the core value of this of this work. And maybe maybe as a final point here, uh, so the ability to self-heal and to recover from spikes is. Uh, I mean, we see this as an essential strength of Nakamoto consensus, and it kind of falls out as a nice feature of the analysis. And this is, in the, uh, this is an interesting distinction compared to, for example, other, other blockchain approaches, for example, iterated BFD protocols, uh, where it presents some difficulty like to recover from such spikes. And for Nakamoto style consensus, it's, it's kind of a feature. And, and this is exactly the nice part of this research. Thank you, Christian. Um, continuing our discussion of resilience and security, um, our next topic concerns the task of generating an unpredictable random beacon on the blockchain, a critical component of the Ouroboros system. Alex, um, if you could tell us a little bit more about that, that would be great. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Miriam. Um, so, as you said, one of the fundamental heartbeats of the Ouroboros system is a sequence of public random values that are extracted at regular intervals from the blockchain itself. So these, these random values, which we often call beacons, are used in a natural way to elect the protocol participants who have the right to add new blocks to the blockchain. And as you can imagine, an important part of the protocol's security proof focuses directly on, on rigorously ensuring the, the quality of this sequence of random beacon values. So considering that the random values arise from the blockchain itself, there's a rather obvious experiment that an attacker might try in which she investigates the various, say, short-term extensions of the blockchain that might arise depending on her own actions. And for each of these extensions, determine the, the beacon value that would ensue. So the slide shows a cartoon tree of options that might arise from such adversarial considerations. Of course, this experiment is actually a bit tricky for the attacker to carry out because she can only predict the contents of future blocks for which she happens to be lucky enough to produce, which is to say that, that future honestly generated blocks directly limit the, the leverage of this sort of look ahead experiment. In any case, the Ouroboros security analysis handles such adversarial behavior with a conservative approach that aggressively amplifies the security of the underlying protocol to such heights that the results of these look ahead experiments are essentially useless to the adversary for, for the same reason that, for example, cryptographic hash functions are secure. There, there simply isn't enough computing power to exhaustively evaluate the hash function to say, find a collision or find an input that hashes to a particular value. So the Ouroboros Thos protocol takes a more nuanced approach to this problem and achieves a qualitatively different security guarantee. In particular, 
by adopting an alternate protocol for determining beacon values in the blockchain, such adversarial look-ahead experiments are controlled by direct combinatorial means that don't need to appeal to intractability arguments, but instead provide absolute guarantees. One intuitive way to appreciate the improvement offered by Thos is that the various choices of an attacker to influence a random beacon are drastically reduced, as shown on the slide. Aside from these Perhaps philosophical consequences, the Thoas protocol can permit important efficiency improvements because it can generate high quality randomness while assuming much less about the blockchain to which it's coupled. Thank you, Alex. Um, I suppose randomness is an important aspect of Ouroboros. Um, another aspect we want to talk about is time. How do you plan to improve resilience there? Christian? Yes, thank you. So that's a really uh, important question. Uh, and it's a very relevant topic, uh, which led us to develop Ouroboros Kronos. So maybe let me try to elaborate a bit the broader picture here. Um, so time is a crucial parameter uh, to many proof of stake systems, in including Ouroboros. Uh, and the reason why is you might know that, uh, so time is divided into these the, into this discrete quantities we call slots. In every slot, there is a leader election that's taking place and uh, the leader has the right to create a block for that slot and then send it to all other parties. So that is the basic setting. And what is important here, or one aspect that is important here, is that parties should not be like, say, hour apart from each other when they execute the protocol. They should have roughly the same notion of time. So they should know roughly uh, you know, what, what time it is, and all, they should all agree on that. So that means in the design somewhere, some form of time synchronization needs to happen. And often you would just use the network time protocol or uh, NTP for short. And this has proven indeed to be kind of a reliable source of time. In reality, uh, computers have other ways to, to measure uh, the time and they could do cross checks among several sources. So from a security point of view, I mean, we already know that an attacker has to do a lot to fake a consistent reality to a lot of machines. So, uh, nevertheless, however, I would say it, it's nice to not to depend on an external protocol for such a task uh, and build a clock functionality, so to speak, directly into the protocol itself. And this is what Kronos does. Uh, so removing the dependency, so to speak, on this sub-module that gives me time uh, can improve the situation on various fronts. So, you, for example, you don't need to react on updates of this sub-module you potentially get efficiency gains. And what we also show in uh, Kronos, uh, what you actually get is also an improved security in a, in a strong cryptographic sense against uh, uh, cryptographic adversaries. So Kronos builds cryptographically secure reference for global time and integrates this with uh, the longest chain protocol based on Genesis. So the clock synchronization mechanism, as you see on the slide, is a way to compute a reference of time. And the only assumption we need is that clients or nodes have local devices available by which they can measure the passage of time. So this can be any ticking device that is more or less accurate in measuring uh, uh, seconds. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of the high level goal of uh, Kronos. Maybe just to put quickly this summary uh, into context, I would just uh, point out that, of course, we were not the first to think about clock synchronization in distributed environments. In fact, uh, the task of clock synchronization is a prominent topic in computer science and uh, has been a core problem in the distributed systems community for decades, actually. Uh, and this research has, uh, has brought many beautiful results. Uh, but unfortunately, the, the reason we just cannot uh, take uh, these results and, and apply them in our setting is that is that our settings di setting differs from from uh, from the setting typically considered in these works, uh, namely, uh, namely what we consider is uh, is a permissionless setting when uh, where the population of participating parties is changing dynamically, whereas uh, typically the literature assumes a fixed set of parties, and achieving actually achieving clock synchronization in such an open ad hoc network has been open for many years. So if you are interested in the details of how this protocol works, uh, it will appear at this year's Eurocrypt conference, which takes place in a few weeks. So if you're interested, just stay tuned for the conference talk recording that will describe the workings of the protocol in much greater detail and will appear on YouTube sometime in October. Thank you, Peter. 
An important, often underappreciated component of any blockchain protocol is the network layer. That is how nodes communicate with each other. Sandra is going to explain the challenges that arise in this area. Yes, thank you, Miriam. Uh, that's right. Um, so to start by pointing out that uh, given the sheer number of participants and the dynamic participation that is typical in permissionless blockchain protocols, the standard way to connect nodes is by some kind of gossip layer. Um, since in the past there have been attacks presented against the gossip protocols uh, that underlie certain popular blockchains, uh, the team at IOG has very carefully designed the network layer uh, that is used by uh, World Boris. Um, and th there has been a big focus on managing system resources in order to avoid so-called uh, resource uh, ex exhaustion attacks uh, launched by malicious peers. It has been customary uh, in the past, um, and th this is what you see on the left-hand side here of the current slide, um, to look at the networking and consensus layer separately, where the only feature the networking layer exports to the consensus layer is the timely delivery of new blocks. So in other words, the consensus layer expects that the network delivers a new block within some reasonable time bound uh, to all participating nodes. And so the, the novel thing about our the Byzantine networking project is that for the first time uh, we consider networking and consensus together and we do so in a mathematically rigorous fashion. And this lets us leverage the guarantees offered by the proof of stake blockchain to harden the networking layer. In particular, uh, the blockchain can reliably answer such questions as uh, how can I find a, a group of participants to reach out to so that you know, I have some guarantees that some of them will be honest. Yeah, great. So Sandro, before we leave this topic, I'd like to make a, a few brief comments about the technical part of the enterprise. So we, we formally analyze the performance of the network layer with techniques from the theory of sparse expander graphs. So here we're particularly in interested in what's called the diameter of the network spanned by the nodes. That's the largest distance or number of hops between any two nodes in the network. And intuitively, the lower the diameter, the faster new blocks can reach all nodes in the network. What makes our analysis challenging and novel is that we consider malicious nodes whose objective is to directly disrupt the network. So put simply, the network must reliably serve the blockchain protocol, even though it can only count on network routes that do not travel through malicious nodes. So ultimately, our results construct a network on the fly, in fact, uh, with two important properties. So first of all, the network offers practical scalability by maintaining strict control on the number of peers that each node is responsible for communicating with. And additionally, the network guarantees that despite an adaptive, an adaptively changing set of malicious nodes, there's a large fraction of honest nodes that remain connected by a low diameter network and hence can gossip with each other very efficiently. So we think of these nodes as a kind of honest backbone of the network. You can see the, the image on the right-hand side of the slide here. So a, a final feature of the approach is that the network evolves over time. So this both is important to reflect changes in the protocol participants themselves, but it also frustrates malicious attacks that might try to persistently disconnect a particular node from the, from the honest backbone. So um, Sandro, Alex said that sometimes it's possible for an attacker to temporarily isolate certain honest nodes, and he's just outlined how to deal with this. But what happens if, for example, due to some global internet outage, nodes become completely separated? Uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, so how to deal with network splits is a very important consideration when uh, designing a protocol. Um, and uh, basically there are two main approaches uh, that one can follow here. Either one can do what is called liveness favoring or, uh, or one can uh, adopt a safety favoring uh, design. Blockchains, for example, uh, based on so blockchains based on Byzantine agreement protocols, um, uh, such as Algorand, for example, uh, they favor safety. So during a network split, no new blocks will be produced because the absence of uh, too many participants means that uh, not enough votes on a single block can be cast to meet the required threshold. 
Now, uh, once the split ends, of course, uh, the, the production of blocks uh, will resume. Uh, on the other hand, Nakamoto-style protocols like uh, Ouroboros or uh, Bitcoin are uh, liveness favoring. So during a split, in the partitions, new blocks will be produced. And uh, after the split ends, however, there you know, will be some reconciliation. And here one should note that it's possible that uh, double spins occur during the split. So clearly we would somehow like to you know, try to get the best of both worlds. Uh, however, the uh, well-known cap theorem says that a protocol that exports a single ledger state um, you know, cannot simultaneously achieve uh, consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. However, luckily for us, uh, this impossibility does not rule out that uh, each client could individually decide whether they prefer liveness or safety. Um, to, uh, you know, they could individually decide which one they're okay with failing in extreme events. So, you know, a user that prefers safety might never have issues with rollbacks, but they could potentially be stalled, while a user that prefers liveness will not be stalled, but under bad circumstances might experience rollbacks. And this kind of opens a whole new design space for, for protocol. Okay, exactly. And uh, maybe let me add that this was exactly actually the starting point of this new project that we call Peras. So what's a good design for a robust protocol? Um, in the, in, you know, when, when we could, would assume that network splits uh, might happen. So based on what you said, Sandra, what can aim at to design a blockchain protocol that offers the choice uh, between a safety first and liveness first mode. So let me be a bit more concrete. So we speak here of a single protocol that just gives you two options to interpret what the ledger behind it is. So if you look now at the slide, we, you know, we sketched uh, three circumstances, and, and we would like to quickly elaborate on, on what could the design offer in this case. So on the left, we see the typical Nakamoto setting uh, where connectivity is assumed of the network. Uh, we have honest majority. In the middle, we have network splits. And on the right, we have full participation and a reliable network. So a single protocol, what could be done is it could offer the following combination of properties. Uh, a safety first client you know, would never experience any, any rollback, but it could face liveness issues in settings one or two. It just doesn't go forward. Uh, its ledger state is, uh, of such client is only guaranteed to advance in a setting uh, that we see on the right, like with full participation. And on the other hand, a liveness first client will not have those liveness, issue, liveness issues, but in setting two, it might observe some, you know, temporal or uh, restricted, uh, limited or uh, reorganization of its of its uh, lecture, yeah. Right, and uh, let me add one final point to this. Uh, so the uh, cryptographic literature has started to tackle this question. Uh, and uh, a prominent design pattern is to checkpoint a longest chain protocol using an additional uh, Byzantine agreement mechanism. And now safety favoring, uh, you know, basically means that you only consider checkpoints as, as confirmed. And liveness favoring means that uh, you follow the longest chain rule uh, anchored to the most recent checkpoint. Now, of course, the details of this are, are quite involved. Um, but to answer the original question about what happens in the case of network splits, some security properties are given up and some are retained. And the client can choose which combination is uh, best for his or her priorities. Now we switch to discuss performance and scalability. A first important aspect of scalability is throughput. And I'll let Peter explain what tools we have at our disposal to optimize this metric. Thanks, Miriam. Uh, yes, indeed. So the two key performance measures of a distributed ledger protocol are throughput and latency. And by, uh, just to quickly explain, by throughput, I mean how much data corresponding to the transactions in the ledger uh, are stored in the ledger per unit of time. So if you wish, the transactions per second uh, property of the, of the protocol. And uh, by latency, I mean uh, looking at a particular concrete transaction and asking how long does it take for this individual transaction from the point it is issued by someone until it is immutably included in the ledger. And so let's talk about throughput first. Uh, people have proposed various ways to improve throughput of the longest chain rule 
uh, blockchain protocols during the Bitcoin scaling debate uh, years ago, starting with the naive approach of shortening block intervals and uh, or increasing uh, block size. Uh, by now, it's well, un well understood that these modifications would go against the security of the protocol. And so instead, uh, I would like to discuss an idea that slightly changes the structure of the blockchain, uh, as in fact de depicted on the slide that we are looking at now, uh, where uh, we allow two distinct type of, types of blocks, uh, ranking blocks and input blocks, so let me explain. Um, so by ranking blocks, I mean your usual block forming an ever-growing chain, uh, that we all know it from the current Cardano deployment, let's say. Uh, however, with one important difference, uh, these blocks, in fact, do not contain transactions. Instead, they contain special pointers to the other type of block, input block, uh, as a way to reference them. And uh, it's the input blocks that actually carry the payload of transactions. Uh, and the leaders for creating these input blocks are determined by an independent stake-based lottery, anal analogous to the one for ranking blocks. Uh, the question, of course, then is how to read out the ledger from the structure, and uh, the way to do it is, is the natural one to go over the sequence of the ranking block, uh, look at all input blocks that these ranking blocks reference in that order, uh, and read out the transactions they carry, and potentially sanitize uh, these transactions as uh, now they don't necessarily need to be uh, consistent as the input block blocks could have been created uh, in parallel. Uh, and this restructuring uh, might at first seem as a cosmetic change, but uh, there is a crucial ingredient to that, which is that while the rate of production of the ranking blocks remains at the usual levels, uh, this is 20 seconds per Cardano, let's say, uh, to allow for safe uh, chain formation via the longest chain rule, in contrast, the input blocks can be produced at a much faster rate, hence allowing for more transactions to be packed uh, into these blocks in total. The concurrency of the creation of the input blocks is no longer a problem, as any input block might be referenced by any ranking block during its lifetime period. Uh, uh, and they don't need to be referenced in the order in which they were created. So if you create an input block, you can uh, rely on the fact that someone uh, creating a ranking block uh, in the near future will eventually pick up your input block and include it. Uh, and this clearly uh, helps boost uh, throughput, but, uh, but uh, the mechanism itself has further benefits uh, associated. So, uh, Agilus, would you perhaps uh, like to expand on that? Yes, indeed. Indeed, uh, indeed, Peter, there are uh, many more benefits, actually, um, in this idea. Actually, this technique uh, goes back to the original Ouroboros paper. The input blocks, or input endorser blocks, as they were called there, were used for a different purpose. The purpose was to ensure that blockchain records the effort of transaction producers in a way that is proportional to the amount of work they put in. This enabled the protocol to have a metric that reliably reflects the contributions of ledger maintainers. This technique it was at the core argument that enabled the game theoretic analysis of the original paper that showed that the protocol is a Nash equilibrium under a plausible modeling of the participant utility functions. Now, to understand why this works, recall that any Nakamoto-style blockchain design in Bitcoin to begin with is subject to the so-called selfish mining attacks, where a determined adversary can disclose blocks it mines selectively. This gives the attacker the power of denying honest miners their work, which is recorded on blockchain forks that are eventually abandoned. As a consequence of this, the attacker can boost the fraction of blocks in the final chain that were created by him and hence reap a disproportionate share of block rewards. On the other hand, using the technique, all input blocks are included and the proportion of input blocks in Ouroboros created by a particular party will always reflect the stake of the party. What is also interesting is that the same mechanism is useful in even more settings beyond high throughput and measuring the contributions of ledger maintainers. For instance, we use exactly the same mechanism in Ouroboros Kronos to sample the participating nodes for their timestamps and apply a median function to extract a suitable local clock adjustment. 
So it is a very useful mechanism overall that we hope to be able to include in a future update of the live Ouroboros implementation in Cardano. Thank you, Agalos. Um, let's now switch gears from throughput uh, to focus on latency, the speed at which transactions are settled on the blockchain. Alex, can you maybe tell us about the efforts along these lines? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Miriam. Um, this is a big topic, so perhaps we'll organize the discussion around uh, two threads of research. The, the first studies the power of, of parallel blockchains to improve settlement time, while the second explores the relationship between high participation and, and fast settlement. So a natural idea for improving the throughput of a blockchain protocol is to attempt to run several blockchains in parallel that eventually, and perhaps implicitly, organize their blocks to yield a global ledger. And in this line of research, we show that this idea can additionally be used to improve latency. That is the time it takes a transaction to settle. So the core result here is a black box construction that can be applied to any collection of independent blockchains. Essentially, the construction shows how to view this collection of blockchains as a single global ledger. And interestingly, no extra meta metadata is, is necessary for the technique. In fact, the constituent blockchains don't even need to know that they're a part of this grander system. So we then show that um, the construction provides linear improvement in latency. So roughly, when applied to M independent parallel blockchains, the resulting global ledger settles about M times faster. And in fact, the construction can even be scaled up in the limit, if you will, to provide a ledger that uh, settles in time that depends only on network delays. So a final remark, as illustrated in the slide, latency improvement is delivered when users submit their transaction to each of the constituent blockchains. However, if users prefer, they can submit their transaction to a single one of the underlying blockchains. And while this does not offer improved latency, the transaction is still guaranteed to settle in the global lecture, in, in the global ledger, and in fact does so at approximately the same pace as it would have in the original blockchain. So in this sense, assuming that there's a natural transaction fee, say, associated with each particular submission, the construction gives a latency cost trade-off. Perhaps let me say a few words about the second approach that, that Alex mentioned that we have been considering for uh, improving latency and uh, achieving faster settlement in reverse style protocols. And that is uh, basing the settlement uh, decisions on observed high participation. So if you think about it, while Ouroboros Genesis can tolerate heavy fluctuations in participation rates, it was designed to be able to tol tolerate those. In fact, uh, its deployment in Cardano will rarely suffer from those, as uh, blocks are being created by stable operators, and uh, those can be uh, relied upon to provide these in a timely manner under most circumstances. Uh, given that, it seems reasonable to make an opti optimistic uh, I admit, uh, assumption that the participation in the protocol will be high most of the time and uh, most of the block creating opportunities will be used. Uh, and after all, this is, uh, this is what we observe on the, uh, on the Cardano main chain even today. Um, however, uh, high participation in the re uh, recent uh, past is an event uh, that is observable from, uh, from the chain as, uh, as the slide shows. So, a user can see that the recent chunk of the blockchain is dense. Uh, with this additional information, he can be smarter about deciding whether a particular transaction is already immutable. If it's buried under such a dense segment, uh, it settles faster, as it would be very hard for the adversary to create a competing chain uh, across this dense region. Uh, this intuition can, of course, uh, be quantified, and we want to include it in settlement time recommendations for Cardano. Finally, one topic that deserves a mention is interoperability with other chains. Peter, can you tell us some more about research in this area too? Sure. Uh, we all believe that it is important that the Cardano blockchain is able to communicate with other blockchains within uh, the ecosystem, uh, be it for the transfer of value or uh, exchange of arbitrary messages, for example, uh, among smart contracts living on these chains. Uh, this is what is often referred to as sidechain technology, and the methods for relying messages from one blockchain to another are often called bridges. Uh, in general, the simplest example to have in mind is that uh, I would like to send, say, a single token 
uh, that I own on some chain A, uh, called the sending chain, and that might be the blue chain uh, on the slide. Uh, and I would like to send it to some other receiving chain, uh, be it the red one. Uh, then maybe manipulate the coin there, uh, perhaps pay with it or uh, provide it to a smart contract. And later, uh, the new owner of, uh, of this coin uh, would like to send it back to, to the original sending chain and uh, use it there normally again. Um, the way this is typically done is by issuing a transaction on the sending chain that locks the coin on this chain. Uh, and then uh, providing a proof of such locking uh, to, the, uh, to the receiving chain, where uh, this allows for creating some kind of a wrapped version of that coin on the receiving chain. And later the wrapped coin can be uh, destroyed on the receiving chain, uh, and the proof of this then allows the original coin uh, to be unlocked again on the sending chain. This is, uh, this is a way to uh, achieve, in essence, exactly the behavior that we are after. Uh, and it turned out that the key technical challenge here is to convincingly prove uh, to one chain, I'd say the receiving one in this example, that some transaction is a part of the stable ledger on the other chain, uh, the sending one. And uh, there are many ways to, to do this. Uh, the easiest one uh, from the design perspective is if everyone running the receiving chain is also observing and running a full uh, node for the sending chain, of course, then they know firsthand what transactions were including and included and are stable on the sending side. However, this is, of course, not always desirable or even possible. And uh, so there are more involved and uh, but also more efficient uh, alternatives uh, that uh, aim at providing a succinct certificate uh, to the receiving chain about the inclusion of the sending transaction in the sending chain. Uh, and the important property of this certificate is that, that it must be possible for the parties running the receiving chain to verify at this certificate without having the full stage of state of the sending chain uh, being oblivious to it. And the way how to produce these certificates uh, depend on the, on the concrete instantiation, uh, mostly on the consensus uh, that is used uh, on the sending chain. So as a trivial example, if the sending chain is fully centralized and run by, by a single trusted entity, then simply a signature of this entity is a sufficient certificate of what happened on this chain. But of course, things are more involved if we consider permissionless uh, uh, protocols, be it proof of work or proof of stake uh, blockchains. Uh, but we have published results describing how these certificates can be constructed in both cases. And we plan to use this uh, at the heart of the sidechain technology through Cardano. Actually, Peter, let me add something to that which is quite interesting, the same type of functionality, being able to succinctly certify the state of a blockchain to a participant that is not observing it, is also central to the problem of const constructing light clients. The relation here is that a light client is similar to a ledger maintainer who asks to be provided with a certification of a remote blockchain state. It needs an expedient and reliable way to validate that state and then act on it. In the case of a light client, the task would be to recover a balance of a particular wallet and potentially issue transactions. So we have spent significant research resources studying the basic primitives that facilitate such methods of blockchain state certification, both for proof of work and proof of stake systems. So our most recent work in this domain introduced Mithril a cryptographic certification scheme that enables a large-scale proof-of-stake blockchain, such as Cardano, to issue short certificates validating any element of the blockchain state. Mithril is actually discussed more deeply in a separate presentation in this summit, so I invite you to attend if you want to know more. And this brings us to the end of the panel. Any final remarks, Agalos? Well, I hope the discussion gave you a good glimpse of the exciting research that takes place right now in Ouroboros land. In the end, we aim for Ouroboros Omega to be the most adaptable blockchain protocol, translating to a capability of making the optimal in terms of performance and scalability out of every circumstance, while remaining the best security profile that is feasible. If you want a Swiss army knife in decentralized protocol design. It is admittedly an, an ambitious goal but we have built over the years the deep understanding that is needed to make me confident that we can achieve it. And we also hope that this is a protocol that we would be able to implement in Cardano in the future, subject to the Cardano community embracing our efforts.
Thank you very much for joining us in this panel.